هذه بسم الله سكو Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Mad Mamluks podcast. My name is Sim. Along with me are my co-hosts, Sheikh Hamer. Assalamu alaikum. And Mahin. Assalamu alaikum. Mahin, I got two cameras for you today. Look up. What up? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yes. there's, That's no what's my, up. there's no more. So nice, Oy. nice. Okay. We can do we can do like one of those uh uh high highly produced videos that uh, Al Maghrib and Baina and them they come out with like yeah. multiple angles. They're saying the same thing, but yeah, right. the camera switching. But when you change the angle, you actually it sounds like it's saying something so you, different. You gotta have like some deep thoughts today where I can just like switch off while you're just zoned in, you know? Yeah, for sure. So who we have some esteemed guests today this afternoon. That's correct. We have uh two imams from Canada, Sheikh um, Abu Tamim, and uh, Sheikh Lutfi. Sheikh Lutfi. Is it Sheikh Abdullah Abu, Abu Tamim, right? Sheikh Abdullah Abu Tamim. He just right? loves. He just wanted to say Abu Tamim because it sounds pretty awesome. So yeah, Abu he just wanted to say it. Sim, Sim has a very uh, unusual relationship with Kunyas. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I just give people Sorry. made up Kunyas as well. <laughs> do, you go, do, you, do you go by Abu Zaki or Abu Aisha? No, I go. With, you're supposed to go with this first son. Before my son was born. I went with Abu Aisha. And then she got demoted. She got demoted. <laughs> She's now like, when you're doing something illegal, Uh-oh. you yeah. use that one, you know? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just known as Abu Zakaria. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Okay. Anyways, uh, uh, our uh, esteemed Shuyukh, how are you guys doing today? Sheikh Abdullah, how's everything going today? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I'm doing just fine. And you're from Toronto, right, Sheikh? Yeah, Toronto. Yeah. And uh, Sheikh Lopti, you're from... Okay. Sorry, let's from Montreal. Me. Yes. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And you're from uh, Montreal? Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Yes. Do you speak French? Yes. Have you That's considered... actually my second language. English is my third language. So. Have you considered joining with the uh, Free Quebec Movement of, Ke- <laughs> of Canada? No, no. Are you I'm a separatist? I'm not involved in that. <laughs> no, no, I'm not involved in that. Oh, so, so ha- Halanta Maghribi? Does that it you? Next door, next door neighbor. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay. I was going to talk about TriStar Gym and Faraz Zahabi, but you guys had to talk about some separatists. Well, well, go ahead. But I, no, no, it's okay. No, it's it's over. Over. Well, actually, the first thing I thought about too, Montreal. No, do, you know Faraz, do you know Faraz Zahabi, the trainer of TriStar Gym? Uh, yes, I was there two days ago. I trained there. Yeah. Oh, 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 there we go. All right, guys, we have our favorite guests now of all time. Hey. <laughs> Actually, let's, let's scrap that original topic. <laughs> guys, can we talk about the original topic some other <laughs> No, no, we're joking. So, uh, uh, ahead, Sheikh sir. Abdullah, if we can just start with you, can you just briefly introduce yourself, if you don't mind? Sure. Um, so, um, my name is uh, Abdullah. I, I grew up here in Canada. I was born in Toronto. Um, I spent most of my life in Cambridge, Ontario, which is a smaller town, mostly white people. I don't know how we ended up there, but we were just there. Um, I grew up in, in my school. Um, at one point, I was the only like colored kid. Everybody was white. Mm. So um, there was a masjid. It was, it was uh, quite far from our house. And my father, he used to go there often. And he, he tried to get me connected to the masjid. But um, like since I was born, my mother, she was sick. She had schizophrenia. And my father, he was, mashallah, a very good brother, but he's, you know, he was busy doing his own thing. So growing up, I was a very, very lost kid. And the people at the masjid, they would see me and they'd be like, okay, how is this your father? And, you know, you're like this. But my father, he would always encourage me to be connected to the masjid. And um, one day when I was in, and like, like I said, you know, I was very far from the dean. When I was in high school, I think I was just starting grade nine. Um my father he had a connection to the masjid and he would always encourage me to do the same i would go every so often whenever i got the chance um when i was in grade nine and I'm, and this is you know when you don't have the guidance of your parents or you know people watching over you like that and you're growing up around all non-muslims mm-hmm. and going to the masjid it was always just you know people just criticizing you it wasn't like oh they're showing you love or they're understanding that oh this kid needs some help or he's having issues or whatever no it was just, especially the Indian community, right? The the community was mostly Gujarati folks, and uh, they were just very judgmental. So I didn't really like it too much. Mm. 
But my friends in school, they were either getting kicked out or they were getting sent to jail. It was it was very bad. And I was headed in a very wrong road at that very young age, right? Mm -hmm. But when I was at the masjid, mashallah, there was one brother. I remember him till today. You know, he encouraged me. We were sitting down together and he he was reading Quran and he was he didn't know how to read properly. And he encouraged me. He told me, he said, look, you should you should go and study, mm -hmm. right? You should go and study Islam. You should learn the Quran and things like that. I don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put something in my heart. And I did. I ended up going to study in one madrasa. It was in Canada. I studied there for a year. And then for some reason, it had to close down. Now it was my choice of either going back to high school, which I didn't want to do because I knew it was, I'm just going to end up being the same person again. So my older sister, she booked me a ticket to South Africa. I went and studied there for four years. I came back to Canada. There was a mother over here. I studied again for another four years. And then I traveled to Pakistan for one year. I studied there for a year as well. And um, then, you know, after all this studying, I came back um, to my hometown in Cambridge. And um, I mean, I've seen a, a, like from the Muslim community, right? Those same people who used to, you know, judge me so much and they were, you know, they used to tell me so many things and, and you know, look at me in a wrong type of way. I seen the youth there, their kids. Yeah. And they were going through very similar problems that I was going through. And, you know, just um, it's very sad. Like I seen, you know, growing up in that in that condition, studying the knowledge of the deen coming back and I, you know, I had a rough come up, but you see people from very religious households as well. And, um, you know, they just, unfortunately, it was ridiculous that they were so far from the Dean and it just felt like a huge gap between the elders who were from India, Pakistan, or these Arab countries and the young kids who were growing up in Canada, you know, they were just, they just couldn't connect. So, but anyways, I started where I started working as an Imam and I started doing things in, um, you know, different places. And alhamdulillah, it was nice. I, I mean, I enjoyed it. After some time, I just, I lost hope. You know, I thought that, look, there's there's no point of this. First of all, uh, with no disrespect to anyone, but, you know, they, they call you an imam, right? But an imam means leader. But at the end of the day, you're an employee. And you get treated like an employee. So that was very disheartening for me. And then on top of that, it's like, you know, when you you try to make a change. I'm young, right? I'm, I'm still young. And I was still, I was young when I, was, when I started being an imam. Uh, and how old were you around this time, if you remind me asking? So I, I, I was around, I guess I left to study when I was 15. I came back when I was, I guess, I mean, I started serving, started like serving in massages and started doing things when I was just maybe like 22, 23. And um, at one point I just, uh, I, I mean, there was other issues going on as well, but at one point I made up my mind that, okay, I don't, I don't want to be an imam anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm done with this. There's no point of this. Right. And um when I went to actually, when I went to study in Pakistan, it was not, it was not really with the intention of studying. Uh, at this point, I was I was married. I had my son as well, and um, I just I just I had lost hope in Canada altogether. Mm -hmm. Right, I thought to myself, I'm like, okay, well, here I studied the dean, and you know, this is this is what I want to do. I want to live like a good Muslim, but I just if my if my kids have to grow up and see the things that I've seen and have to grow up, you know, the way that I grew up, I don't want it because Alhamdulillah, by, by the, by the grace of Allah, I was saved from it. But can I guarantee that for my kids? Whereas I'm seeing people who are more religious than me. I'm seeing ulama who are better than me and I'm seeing their kids off track. So what gives me that guarantee? So I never been to, 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 to Pakistan before that. Right. I, I think I went once in my childhood, and but I had to make up the excuse for studying because my family wouldn't let me go otherwise, right? So I made up the excuse that oh, I'm, I'm going to go study over there. I want to I want to study fiqh, right? So I went to study the Hanafi fiqh over there. But my real purpose was to see if I could actually live there, right? Because I didn't. I just I thought, man, like I just don't see an Islamic environment here, and I don't I don't know if I want to live the spend my, the rest of my life over there. And I went, we tried it out. It was, it was, um, it was, it was my wife's for, uh, first time as well there. Um, she's never been, she's also Pakistani. She was, she was born here. She, so she never been either. Um, it was tough. You know, they have their own issues and obviously like, you know, being, being a sheikh over here in Canada, like, yeah, you're going to make some money, but being like a moldy in Pakistan, you're not making anything, you know? Mm. So, um, it, I mean, the financial situation was there too. And, you know, I ended up coming back and then, I, I mean, it was always in the back of my mind that, okay, yeah, you know, like Pakistan is there. 
uh, I could live there. I could, you know, build a house there and things like that. But people would always tell me that, look, you know, you have something special. Like you grew up here, you studied the knowledge of Dean, you could do something for the youth. Mm -hmm. So, but anyways, I tried with a couple of massages, things didn't work out. Um, now I'm, I, I, I was in uh, Brampton where my, where my parents are, are living. And, uh, but at this point I moved my family back to Cambridge and I was living in Cambridge and I was working uh, over there. I was just working like a factory type of job and everything was good. Everything was going well. I was, I didn't even think about being an imam again. All of a sudden there was this one masjid in, in uh, GTA, uh, greater Toronto area. I, I don't want to be specific, but you know, this, um, mashallah, huge masjid bunch of classrooms in there and you know they had a huge uh, banquet hall downstairs and they were right beside like a sports center and they're looking for a youth director now they get in touch with me and uh, my dad he's the one who got in touch with them because he my dad always you know he felt like look you're you studied and you became a sheikh what's the point of you just doing a regular job you're supposed to be serving in a masjid right mm -hmm. and can i so pause, I, sorry sheikh abdullah can i pause you right there because i want if we can just re let uh sheikh lutfi continue like with the intro and now yeah. we're going to try to meet where you guys are yeah. both in and going to be maybe in the same area of contention possibly with your respected so basically you had a regular job and then your dad reached out to the masjid and a masjid and gta to be a youth director right and that's kind well, of where we were looking for a youth director they were looking for a youth director and yeah i wasn't interested i didn't want to do it the only reason i i took up the opportunity is because i wanted to be closer to my parents got it uh, who live who lived in the area so I said, if, if I could, and I told them that when they called me for the interview, I said, I'm not interested. I'm, I really lost hope in the masajid. May Allah forgive me for saying something like that. But oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. But I, but, uh, but I said, look, I, if, it, if it means I get to be close to my parents, why not? You know, I'll just treat it like a regular job. I won't get passionate about it. <laughs> cool. So we're, and we're, we will continue that part. We're just going to have both of your stories meet, inshallah. Uh, Sheikh Lutfi, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of with the same type of detail that Sheikh Abdullah did? If you need to. No, you are mute. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa So your brother Lutfi Abdurrahman, I have been living in Montreal for uh, over two decades, alhamdulillah. Uh, so uh, for around the same time, you know, around the same uh, amounts of time for about two decades, alhamdulillah, I have been active in da'wah. All started in uh, universities. So I was involved in MSA, you know, I did everything. Uh, MSA president, uh, you know, VP Dawa, VP communication with the Dawa tables. I was back in the days, okay, the old generation MSA, not that. I, I know that things have changed a lot nowadays. Uh, we did a lot of um, conventions. I was involved with AMJA, hosting an AMJA convention here in Montreal a few years ago. So, alhamdulillah, I got a lot of experience, you know, uh, doing projects, basically doing work on the ground. Uh, it gives you a lot of contacts. It gives you a lot of information about the nature of the community itself, alhamdulillah, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, you know, I was trying to do my best to do da'wah work, like it basically direct da'wah work, which is teaching Islam in universities and colleges and so on and so forth. So that's where it all started. I was given halaqat and jumu'ah and so on and so forth. Then obviously, you know, a few masjids started contacting me. That was uh, about 15 years ago, yes. um, asking me to do a jumu'ah, to start halaqat and stuff for the youth and everything. Uh, I know some du'at, they like to travel, they like to go around the world. You know, my decision, it's all about a personal choice. My decision was just to focus on my city here. So um, I, I, I move all the time okay so i i have done like alhamdulillah like lectures halaqat khutb, uh, like khutbah of jumu'ah and uh, khutbah eid everything in so many masajid here uh, we have four universities i have taught in the four universities until today i'm a regular khatib at uh, one of those universities alhamdulillah and when you now say you taught had, at yes. the university sorry to cut you sorry, off when you say you no. taught at the university were you like a professor too is that what you mean by taught at the university or no no professor? Through, through the msa sorry beautiful uh, no that's cool. through the msa yeah cool so uh, if look, we could backtrack a little bit like yes. what about like <laughs> as far as uh like if you can just give us a, a brief synopsis about your studies maybe where it was yes. and how it great, was yeah. great so uh i completed my first bachelor's at university montreal here it's a french university french uh, language university it was communication and public relations and then from then I moved to the business school related to the same university and I completed a certificate in leadership studies. And uh, right now I'm half through a, uh, also a program in cybersecurity. So that's pretty different. It's, it's a completely diff different world. It's more of a technical thing. Uh, yeah. 
So uh, and so you know, I, when the yes. when the massage reached out to you to start helping out fifteen years ago, I guess yes. your day job was like an IT. No, no, no. Uh, my day job at that time is a student job because okay. I'm still a student. You're still a student. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Very cool. I, I, I can't, you know, I, I did like full-time imam for very limited amounts of time. You know, that, that's not something I like to do for the reasons that we will be bringing today, inshallah, subhanahu okay. wa ta'ala, because you're actual employee. So my really my focus was khutbah of Jumu'ah and uh, doing the lectures and durus and series and so on and so forth. Although, for the reasons that we will explain today, inshallah, most of my work, I prefer to do it outside of masajid, you know, yeah. universities, colleges, Got even it. renting places, paying for, for the place where you are independent, you can just teach the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal, put the dollars and, you know, just do, just do your work. Got it. Yes. Beautiful. So, Sheikh Abdullah, if you can continue, please, where you had left off as far as uh, youth director openings at the masjid. Yeah, sure. Uh, so what happened is, um, so they, they asked me to come and be a youth director there. And, you know, at this point, I've, I've lost hope, right? Because I, I was very passionate about this work as an imam, right? Or, or, or serving the Muslim community in whichever way I could. And um, I'm not saying, you know, I was always perfect. And obviously, being a young person, you know, you make, you know, you make mistakes. And but I was very passionate about it. So going into it, I made up the mindset that, look, I'm not going to bring my feelings into this i'm going to treat this like a regular nine to five just do my thing and get out you know and and don't even like i'm doing this because i want to be close to my parents because i want to be able to serve them or whatever and uh this is just think of this like a regular job so i went into to it like that and um it, it was good um you know it was alhamdulillah is very the brothers are very nice very nice community very nice brothers it was the, from the beginning till the end until they asked me to resign. Up until that time, uh, they showed me a lot of love. And still today, there's a lot of love. I see them every so often. There's no hard feelings about it, right? But what happened is that, you know, I came in and um, I started, you know, the, the, they already have they already had the two imams serving over there. It's a very big center. It's, it's probably one of the oldest uh, masajid in uh, the great, greater Toronto area. They've expanded and made it into a huge, beautiful masjid. And, um, you know, so they, so in the beginning, there was a few issues where they're asking me to do things, but it was the other imam's responsibility. And um, our teachers, they always taught us that, look, if there's a sheikh and he's already serving somewhere, don't go in there and try to take his place. Right. So it, it it was a little bit, you know, I didn't really like that too much where, you know, they're trying to get me to do things, which is already somebody else's responsibility. So, but, but it was, that was fine. Now I'm meeting youth over time and I've, and I've been involved with, I mean, most of my friends are Muslim, right? And uh, I have some non-Muslim friends as well, but I mean, I'm involved with the Muslim youth. I know about guys, I know about girls, and I know the issues that they have and they face issues that I've faced as well. And, um, and now what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to pitch ideas, right? Now I'm like, okay, I'm a youth director. I didn't come here to teach the Quran classes. I didn't, you already have imams for that. You already have, uh, you know, imams leading the prayers. I'm here to do something for the youth, okay? So I'm pitching them ideas. I'm, email, I'm emailing them. I'm, um, you know, just uh, trying to talk to them. But you're saying them, you're talking about the masjid board, basically. The masjid board, yes, yeah. the masjid management. Again, like, great group of guys. But it got, to, you know, at one point I even told them that, look, um, if it's okay with you guys, I would like to have a meeting. Just give me, and I'm not, I'm not lying to you, this is, this is exactly what I said. I said, if you can give me just 15 minutes in a month that we can sit down together. Imagine what is 15 minutes in, in an entire month? If we can sit down together, and, and I know Sheikh Lutfi, he's going to speak about this as well, the shura, right? Or we call it the mashura, right? Where you, you sit down together and you, you, know, you have a council and you speak about your goals and what you want to achieve and what you've done. I'm, I want to give you a report of what I'm doing. I want to get some feedback. I want to tell you. So I asked them, can you give me 15 minutes a month? And they said, no, you know, you're going to have to like catch us uh, whenever we're here for prayer or whatever. I said, okay, that, that kind of surprised me, but I was like, okay. Um, I'm sending emails upon emails. I'm not getting any replies. I'm trying to get things going. I started teaching some Arabic classes. I started, I was teaching the kids. And then I, uh, I started a youth program on Saturday night. We would rent the basketball court at the sports center next door. 
and you know alhamdulillah like we it was amazing because we had maybe like over 100 youth like boys and girls coming to, you know we'd have a separation the girls on this side boys on this side i would give a small little talk there'd be a q a and it was really nice it was going really well but i mean i'm, I'm doing this by myself so it's very tough for me mm. and um you know especially handling all those kids with the food and the basketball and this, they were helping with, with, with certain things right but i i wanted them to be more involved and and it wasn't really i wasn't really seeing it right so once ramadan happened we took a pause we took a break and um i told them that look you know let's uh let's let's sit down together and let's you know i would like to i at, at this point i've I already prepared presentations and i tried to sit down with them they didn't give me the time even when i prepared a presentation for like an hour i would go sit with they're sitting down having their gathering you know whatever i'd go there i'd be like you know, they'd call me, they're like, okay, not today. I'd go, come back the next day. They'd be like, um, yeah, we're busy right now. Come back some other day. So this kept happening. And it's annoying because I'm coming on my own time on my days, which I'm supposed to have off, right? And I'm coming and um, they're not giving me the time. And when they do give me the time, I'm supposed to get like an hour, half, maybe even half an hour. They give me, after two minutes, they're like, all right, you can go. So, you know, they're not interested. So, so if you can clarify that, what do you, when they say after two minutes, you can go, meaning like, they would just cut you off completely or it was just kind of yeah. it was just kind of yeah. like uh okay we get what you're talking about we'll just talk about this later or something like that yeah yeah like i mean i'm i'm there with my presentation i'm trying to show them they're not really paying attention and they're not interested and like they're you know they're cutting me off and after and instead of speaking and discussing and you know on how we can work these things it's like all right yeah just you know we'll think about it got it and like it's it's it wasn't their priority Right. And it's this is a masjid which has been there for I, I remember going to this masjid when I was seven years old. Right. When I was a young kid, I remember I go, going to this masjid. They used to have a program on Fridays. They would serve food. And I remember all that. Right. So this is a very, very old masjid. So to me, I'm thinking like, man, I stepped on a gold mine here because uh, you had so many classrooms empty, nothing going on, nothing. And this is a this is in uh, this is in Mississauga. Right. This is like uh, they say almost 30 percent Muslim almost. Right. So many Muslims. It's like it, this is where, you know, a huge concentration of Muslims here in, 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 in this part of Toronto. And uh, it's just it's, it's mind boggling that how could you have all these classrooms which are empty, no classes going on, a library, there's no book in there. And they have a banquet hall. And this is, you know, they're just having these dawahs for food and this and that. Like, but they're not doing enough for the youth. What you know, and all this time I'm, I'm having these feelings, but I'm not I didn't express it. Right. Uh, I would say things here and there, but I didn't. I didn't really express it. Um, now that in, in during Ramadan, they asked me to do a throughout competition, and I arranged it. I made the flyers. We had about sixty participants, these young kids, and I promised. They they told me that we're going to give all the participants a prize uh, on the twenty seventh night, right? Which they say is most likely the Al Qadr. So I I announced that, and uh, I told all the kids that, and the parents. And then later on, they came to me and they said, oh, we're not going to give it to all the kids. We're just going to give it to the top three from the boys, top three from the girls. And, you know, I was obviously upset about that because, look, I made a promise to these kids. But I said, OK, well, what are you going to do? And then I, I kept and I, I know by now I understand the nature of these guys. They don't really, you know, this these type of programs and these youth events, these are not their priorities. So I'm reminding them over and over and over. I'm going to them, you know, in person, over text. I'm telling them, like, don't forget 27th night. We have to have a prize for these kids. You know, you, we promised them. And, you know, they didn't even prepare like a proper prize. It was just some cash, okay, that they were going to give them like, okay, 27th night comes, an hour of, of dua, an hour of fundraising. You know how it is on, you know, oh. I, I don't know how it is over there, you know, but yeah. this is how they do it, right? And, you know, these kids are waiting and these kids are looking at me, you know, waiting for the, for the announcement to come for their prize and this and that. And no announcement happened. And... I was in Etikaf. I broke my Etikaf. I, I left my cell phone at home because I wanted to focus on my Etikaf. I went home, I got my cell phone, and I started apologizing to the parents. And, you know, they, they, some of the parents even came up to me after the whole dua and the fundraising was done, right? The khatam of the Quran. And, um, you know, they said to me, they're like, man, you guys made a promise, right? And, you know, these these kids were, they were looking forward to it. Yeah. So, I was like, man, that that's, that's what set me off. I'm like, man, this is just ridiculous. Like, like even even like this is how much you you don't care. This is how much like you know you, you th these are your priorities that you even you make a promise to these kids and, and you just ignore it, even though I've reminded you so many times. So at that point, I was just uh, I was thinking to myself, and I never done you know this something like this. I 
was I've always prepared my Juma khutbas. Um, that Juma, I was for two, three days earlier, I was just debating with myself. I'm like, man, should I, I just want to go there and speak my heart. You know, I, I don't even, I don't want to prepare anything. I just want to go there and just, just talk what's in my heart. Right. Yeah. Um, a week prior to that, one politician here, um, Jagmeet Singh, uh, sorry to name drop, but yeah, he, he came and, you know, he's, he's a nice guy, great guy. I'm, you know, amazing person, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide him to Islam. Mm-hmm. You know, but he, but he, um, you know, he came to the masjid for, for, for his, you know, uh, political campaign. And, um, you know, they gave him a spot to pray right behind the imam. Like he's, mm-hmm. he prayed literally right behind the imam because he, apparently he knows how to pray. And I'm, I don't even, I don't think he had wudu or, he, you know, even the ghusl maybe, right? But he's praying right behind the imam. Uh, this is in the first Juma, and, and people, alhamdulillah, like, you know, do we still have... Um, you know, this Iman and this faith in the Muslim community that some of the brothers came up to me and they said, man, what is this? Like, does my prayer even count that I I literally stood right beside a mushrik, like a non-Muslim? And, <laughs> and you know, like, well, what is this, right? And he's praying right behind, you know, like the Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, that the person who stays uh, stands behind the Imam should be a person who has knowledge, right? This is why we usually get a, ha- a hafiz or, or an alim, a sheikh to stand behind the Imam or the muazzin or whoever it is. Like you're giving that position to, you know, uh, like a politician to, okay, he wants to pray, maybe make him stand on the side, maybe something, but you're getting, he doesn't even have wudu and he's standing right. And that you're Muslim, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. And uh, it was, it, I mean, that that sort of bothered me as well, right? But now I'm debating with myself, I'm doing with myself, I'm like, man, should I do it? Should I not do it? Right. And I'm like, man, you know what? Just like, I'm, I, I'm so like, I'm tired of this. It's not just me. I'm seeing Muslim youth and, and throughout this time while I'm serving there as a youth director, I'm having people coming to me with some serious problems. I don't want to, I don't even want to mention them because it's just, you know, just very foul things, just having really big issues, you know, with drugs, with mental issues, mental yeah. health issues, sure. uh, with, you know, adult, a lot of, a lot of bad issues, you know, unfortunately. The, Shake up the, the, I, I want to backtrack, like just to put it in context, you were obviously hired, brought in to be the youth director, right? Um, yes. And based on your father's connections, what was the messaging you got from them when you first started? Basically, when they were interviewing mm. you or all that kind of stuff, because it seems like did you ha- see signs early? It seems like during your whole tenure there, they were just checked out. They didn't care. But what kind what was the messaging you got from them when you first met them before you were actually brought on board? As far as why they wanted the youth director, what what, what were they saying at the time? So what they i mean it wasn't it wasn't with with, as far as my responsibilities went it wasn't so clear because you already had imams there who were leading the prayers and um you know they were teaching classes and things like that what their what their main thing was that look our youth see that that's the thing i don't have anything against these brothers because i don't feel like they're bad guys i don't think they're bad even now i don't think they're bad guys why not why not because I think they're, they're I think that they're they're bad in, in the sense that they don't care. And I think you're giving them a free pass by by maintaining uh friendly relations with them because that's what they want. They want they don't want right. bad PR. So they want to make sure that they're friendly with you but they they're holding knives behind their their back and the moment you say something about them they'll make sure they say things about you or you know Sheikh uh, Abdullah didn't come on time so at such and such time or he missed Salah this one time they be, make they keep notes of all these things yeah. to to unleash on you so uh, I, you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't have friendly relations with them and uh, you should let as many people know as possible because these people they thrive on um, they, they love using the Islamic context or the the language related to brotherhood and not creating fitna. You always hear the word fitna being thrown out. Uh, yeah. This Sheikh Abdullah, he's causing fitna among our community while completely ignoring all their um, irresponsible actions, all their um, ignoring of you reaching out to them to solve these problems in the community. They 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 apply some in the way they want to apply it. When, and the reason why Tim is actually kind of passionate about that, we, I mean, the states are not alien to those issues too happening in the massage too. That's why, I mean, he's not saying this is based on your thing. Yours may be a little different than what we've seen here, right? It may be a little different, right? So, but, um, and this is not, this is not meant to say, hey, what you're saying is completely wrong. You should think they're evil. That's not what we're saying either. 
what we're saying is that this happens in the Western world, this happens and it's pretty normal, right? So there's obviously a, a big movement of people that aren't going to stand for that anymore because um, we don't want to be the ones responsible for the continuing of this tarnished legacy of Masajid, right? Is that, is that safe well, to say? Well, yeah, it's not just that. There's also these, what's driving me nuts is that there's other Imams who are taking these positions that good brothers like Sheikh Abdullah and uh, others have, have left and what needs to happen maybe an informal type union you know you know how there's like union workers who you know they they band together and they say hey we've identified this 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 mosque as a problem and if you if you get one of our guys you're not getting anyone from our you know how they, like in, in, in hollywood union, yeah, yeah. In, in, in hollywood they have like a screen a screen actor, right, guild, right, yeah. Right, yeah their guild like it's a it's a formation of like brother brothers who are in this profession of being imams or, or youth directors or whatever and you you identify a problem spot and you mm -hmm. say hey this is not and then th this is how the community pressures yeah. their leadership to change you can, if you're like going to have unions did, yeah, yeah. If, if there's going to be you know uh, a new new person who just backfills uh, right. um Sheikh Abdullah's spot the problem is just going to keep going right. on and on. No, it's, Sims on the money here because I, I almost think there's like an audit. You know, we we have we have like more like Hafsa, like they audit how like halal because you know because restaurants have like they're, they're selling you Purdue chicken and saying it's halal. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, versus, so you should uh, there should be like there might be an idea for somebody. It's like you we have to create an auditing agency, a third party that can like put these people that, that some of these people need to be called to account mm -hmm. because otherwise just bad behavior just. You know, and Sim's absolutely right. They're just going to play the other card when it's convenient. But, like, what they did to those kids was messed up, man. Yeah, yeah. That's that sad. that was like, I, I mean, that's I don't even have kids, in, kid, kids in, in, the, in their program, but I felt for it, right? No, but it's not even just about the kids. It's all going to be on Sheikh Abdullah. Yeah, he's, the, he has to take the hit. Yeah, they go all break his intikaf, right? And then, you know, it's like he's trying to damage control as much as he can. Yeah. And they don't even, they have, there's like zero remorse. Yeah. Like, well, they should not be in that position. So, no, and I'll let you continue about the Sheikh uh, Abdullah there's one thing that look some people build connections because there's like a worldly benefit involved so you build connections we know about that right people build certain connections they need certain things to exist so now let's talk about the masjid they need certain initiatives to exist in the masjid so they can collect more donations it's a very simple concept right but one thing that i what in my experience is that many muslim organizations don't realize is which is the most valuable relationship is when it's an imam or a resident scholar or a youth director when they're building these relation like pure awesome relationships with youth and just the community those relationships should be off limit and if the board were to think that we have to preserve just relationships this amazing human beautiful relationship between two muslims right yeah everything has to revolve around that so any move that we're going to make how is it going to affect for instance in his case the youth director's relationship with the youth yeah or else we can't do it even if, dude, even if it's like a politician that comes in let's just say who's known for certain ideas but it's going to affect the relationship between muslims then you can't have that person be there not hey we got to have this person come here because it's going to increase our voting block or whatever the case is that's not that's completely secondary maybe even like should be fifth yeah in line because the reason i'm saying that is i know what that's like when you build relationships with people and you build this trust and because of somebody else's decisions they're tarnishing that relationship which was far greater than any other relationship that that happens in that message yeah do you I, understand what i'm saying well one of the things is that this is that it can't be confused with is that this is a vendetta that you know you took it personally and you're you're uh fighting back this is for the sake of allah that you are changing the situation you're mentioning the name of the organization like for example with the sheikh amirs i he wasn't wanting to mention the name of his previous employer where he was eventually you know he had to resign and leave uh, that was a uh, islamic foundation in villa park if in case anyone forgot and uh shame on the brother who took his position no but don't say that. <laughs> he, he didn't know either he was no, blindsided I'm just but anyway it's not making this about ourselves but it's not uh, about ourselves but anyway but, yeah um I, by the way i'm I mean, we're making it clear i'm totally joking about that brother taking his position <laughs> um no, so but but anyway. <laughs> uh, Welcome to the man we, loose. <laughs> right. any, anyway, anyway, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. 
Um, okay, so the reason why why I'm I'm saying that I don't think they're bad guys is because look, man, these guys, you know, they grew up in 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 in, in you know another part of the world, right, where it was an Islamic environment. Now over there, the masajid they just they're there for five times daily prayer in the juma and you know every so often they'll have like the a talk or whatever a speech right now over here the masajid but they don't understand that look our kids they're they're going to you know public school here and the type of filth that they're learning um you know especially in canada if you know what's going on over here in the education system it's really bad right and um and, you know and there's so many other issues and now you know, I'll just tell you one incident, and and I've and I'm, there's a lot of incidents I've seen like this. I was when I was studying in in Toronto and uh, Scarborough specifically, um, I'd witnessed this with my eyes. Um, the the muazzin of one of the local masallas there, you know, he his son. This is the muazzin, very religious guy, you know, uh, Gujarati Indian, right? He's the muazzin of the masjid. His son and one other brother, mashallah, very active da'i, very good brother, his younger brother. So these two young men, Muslim kids from both from very good homes, they both pulled a gun out on each other Wait. and the other one shot the other one and, you know, he, he, he died. The Muslim son died, but he had a gun on him too. And what? this, you know, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. They, they, over what? Girl, just 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 it could be a girl, it could be gang, gangs, or whatever. Maybe the reason it's not known yet. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is the condition, right? And I'm and I'm telling you, like, like you see some some very good ulama, you see some very good, you know, the da'is, very good brothers. You see the condition of their kids. You're like, what happened? What happened? Like, and was this like in like a really rough area, like a ghetto type thing, ghetto setup, or? No, oh, man. This is this is uh, this is Toronto, Canada. This is not Southside Chicago. Yeah, Toronto, no. Toronto doesn't have <laughs> unless you're on like Finch in York. Everything's good. Yeah, I mean, there's areas like that. But to be perfectly <laughs> honest with you, nobody needs a gun in in Canada or in Toronto. Yeah, yeah. We, we we have many people shoot in, enough shootings in Chicago in one day. They have in like in like two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when you see that, you're like, okay, it's not. It's not the the non-Muslim people who are doing this. Why is it that the Muslim kids are coming out as these gangsters? Why is it? And it's not. And you know, some very. I have a friend as well, very uh, great sheikh, uh, mashallah. He works in prisons and stuff, and now he's seeing these these kids. And we as we as desis, like we really pride ourselves over our cons, uh, you know conserved communities, from some of these very religious backgrounds or in these very religious desi communities. You have sisters girls who are in jail for selling drugs in the, you know, yeah. And, and propose, yeah it's it's crazy it's crazy and it's um you know that, that's what that's what i meant i just i gave up altogether. so when i you know when i when i went in as a youth director i had all this hope that you know what may if i let's find that can use me to make a difference then you know i'll do it but then when i but anyways let's just get back to it so that friday i was debating with myself and i was like you know what man just forget it so i went up there I gave that speech. Uh, there was a brother with me in Etikaf. He's always been. T he was telling me like, "Oh, I, I want to record like a, like a speech or things of your, you know." You, I said, "Don't take my video. If you want to take audio, you can, you know, do the audio." And I, but that day specifically, I'm like, you know what? I want you to record it. So he recorded it, and then I shared with a few people, just mm -hmm. a few friends, right? And then it just, it just, it, it went like everywhere, right? And oh, I, yeah. and I, I didn't even listen to it myself. We I didn't got listen it in to Chicago, it. brother. We got it in Chicago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that a Juma? Was that Juma? Yeah, that uh, was a Juma khutbah, and that was um, they like, yeah, that was the Juma. Um, you know, this was the last Juma, right? So this is like the last Juma of the Ramadan. Uh, so there was, you know, there was there was quite a bit of a crowd there as well. And I and I and I didn't prepare the speech that day. I'm like, I just want to. I don't even. I don't even remember what I no, said. No, you can tell you. us from the heart, bro, because... Yeah, yeah I, I don't remember. Did you listen to the clip? Yeah, I heard it. It was very refreshing for me because it was like three months after I started my new job where I got kind of shafted with the organization that I was in. And I was like, yeah, brother. I was like in the middle of a meeting. I muted my meeting at work and I was just listening to your khutbah and I was like pacing back and forth in my office listening to it, celebrating internally. Well, I, I, I got to check it out. But uh, like, So I assume that was your last khutbah, the masjid? Yes, oh, yes. Yeah, so so after that, that after that, they uh, cool. they asked me like not to. Uh, they said, okay, you're not allowed to use the member. You can't have any <laughs> gatherings. Or... I'm an exactly. Islamic, right? So I'm I, every every day after Usher, we do like a little fiqh halakha, and then people are like, oh, we're, we're, what are you doing with this? And I'm like, okay, I'm not allowed to be in any gathering. 
I, I used to read the hadith before the iftar. I wasn't allowed to do that. So I'm thinking, okay, you know, so I'm telling people that, look, I can't do anything. They go back to the to the brothers and the manager. Management is like, no, we didn't say anything to him. And it's like, okay, why why would you do that? Why are you lie to them? But this goes back to what's your point. You're like, okay, so it's one thing to be in a Muslim country. Yeah. But if they're straight up lying to their constituents, of course, like that's, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. yeah, and they're they're going to keep getting away with this because we're not calling them out. And I, I encourage you, brother, yeah. to to mention their I names. I mean, I actually, you got to be motivated. Right name, you don't want to put them in a weird No, I don't, I don't, I don't, want, I don't mean to put, put the brothers in, the, in, the, in, a, in a difficult situation, but like, I'm just saying in the future, maybe consider something like that, you know, because uh, hey. these brothers, they're not going to change. Yeah. They're going to keep doing what they did to you, to other brothers who take up your position and so on. And well, well Ultimately, these these boards are a reflection of us, not us who are in this room, but our broader community. We ourselves have become fixated on allowing certain positions, certain types of people into power, people with influence, money. Um, and th these people have established themselves in permanent positions and boards where they're just not going to leave um, unless there's something where they're, unless where they, they're forced out. Right. So. Yeah we've we've ultimately we are ultimately responsible for the situation that has happened to the mosques no but like you said it's a reflection mm -hmm. of us man this is who we are man this yeah. is this is the level that we've uh, gone down to as uh, the ummah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that uh, instead of taking care of real priorities we're just uh, worried about power in this microcosm in this grand scheme of things to hold on to these little tiny strands of power which are just in a small community so at least we can look in the mirror and think that we've accomplished something and in the process we're, we're okay with dare i stay stomping on the hearts of other believers you know what i'm saying um but uh if we can shift to sheikh lutfi real quick um so what what is i know that you're not you guys are not obviously in the same masjid you guys are not working in the same masjid right but you guys have something similar as far as raising awareness which is why you know alhamdulillah you guys are here so can you just sheikh lutfi can you let us know what's what's happening on your end what's how, what did everything transpire to yes subhanallah there's a lot to share but obviously we don't have time so i'll just focus on one story that's very similar to uh sheikh abdullah's story which happened you know right before his story and then i got a recording of his speech that he gave <laughs> mashallah and i was very happy that alhamdulillah there are st still people of khair standing up for the truth and you know uh, oh, knowing Allah. that Allah Azza wa Jal will ask them Yawm al qiyamah about their amana, you're not accountable to the board, you're accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you're really making da'wah to Allah Azza wa Jal, if you're not there for only for the money. So uh, my story is, uh, I guess, is going to make uh, Brother Sim happy because uh, this story I'll be sharing, inshallah. It's about the bad people, it's not about the good people. As I told you, I, I have worked with a lot of masajid and I still do. Like, I, I don't have time to offer, you know, until today, they still call me for Jumu'ah and I have to apologize all the time that, you know, I can't this Jumu'ah, I can't next Jumu'ah. So I, I can distinguish very easily between brothers who are unprofessional, good brothers who are unprofessional. They don't know how to do things. Uh, they have bad cultural baggage. So you have to push them. You have to be very patient and sometimes to be a little bit harsh, but you're, they are still your brothers in Islam. And you, we have to, uh, to make a distinction between those good people, alhamdulillah, our brothers, and some people who are really there and they are corrupting our masajid they are corrupting our organizations they are a threat to the future of our community we have to say it very clearly and inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's you know one point inshallah i will leave it a bit for the end because it will shock a lot of people this is a critical point in the topic that we are covering i will leave it for the end because otherwise i know the whole discussion will be centralized over over it for the rest of the podcast so my story to be very brief i had one main masjid just like i said 50 percent of my work was outside masajid completely independent alhamdulillah 50 percent you cannot ignore masajid it's still you know uh, the house of allah Azza wa we have to be present and to uh, to offer our services and uh, among all the masajid i had one masjid where it was my main masjid my priority I have been the khatib there for about 15 years. Hmm. I was the khatib there. So I'm not the full-time imam. They have their imam. Sometimes the imam, you know, goes for a trip or something. They ask me and I try to do my best, you know, to fill uh, to fill the gaps. But I always prefer not to be the imam. But because the masjid is, is big, Masha, it's one of the biggest masjid here. And it's a high concentration of Muslims area. 
we don't even have space for one. We have to do two Jumu'ah. In COVID, we had to do up to 10 Jumu'at, like Jumu'ah after Jumu'ah. Myself, you know, it happened to me to do like once up to seven Jumu'at in one in one Friday, like one after the other, right? What? It's a, it's a big community. It's a huge community. Wait, hold on. Let me, is, there was a yes. time where you had to give seven khutbas in one day? Is Sorry? that what you said? Seven yes. khutbas in one month or one day? One day, one day. One day, one day. Inna lillah. One day. Wow. Because here they had extremely, they were extremely restrictive, the government, in terms of COVID. I see. Yeah, yeah. Piras and, told, Piras told us. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. And these people, they did not help. You know, the administration, they make things worse. So when the government says to do 10, they will do 20. They will do the double, right? So that, that's that's a different topic, subhanAllah. So, you know, there's a, a lot of lot of pressure. People, they expect you to do everything. But alhamdulillah, you know, everything is the deen of Allah Azza wa I live far. It, it used to take me five hours, six hours of, of, my, of my Friday to go all the way there to come back. So, alhamdulillah, I was there for about 15 years. And, you know, on the min bar, I'll be very honest, they never told me, speak about this topic or don't talk about this topic i know some khatibs they do get restrictions you know i was always free nobody ever dared to come to me and say don't say this or, or say this right i just come i pick my topic they try that you know sometimes to say can you coordinate with the other imam i'm like i can't he's 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 talking in arabic his Jumu'ah is in arabic he's talking to a specific segment of the community i'm talking to a different segment we can't talk about the same topics so i pick my own topics now what happened um, this was back in September, October. Subhanallah, we had this trend here in Quebec where a lot of these major masajid, they were taking it next, you know, the next level. Politicians coming in every Friday, every Jumu'ah to, you know, interrupt our Jumu'ah. And they were bringing the liberals and conservatives, the federal election, provincial election, the city election, everything happening you've got some candidate coming in today, sometimes two, three of them, okay? So before Jumu'ah or after Jumu'ah, and it got to a point where it was so ridiculous, subhanAllah, it became like a political market. There was no uh, hurma of the masjid anymore. I saw it myself, you know, a lady taking the microphone and shouting at the Musaleen, don't vote for the other guy, naming someone else, you know, another candidate. Vote for me. He doesn't love you. I love you, people. Wow. And she's shouting in the masjid. They know that I disagree with this. So they always made sure, you know, to bring the politician, not in my Jumu'ah. Or sometimes, you know, the politician comes in. I leave the minbar before he's, he's, he's in the front. I don't want to be associated with these type of activities. Now, as I said, they got to a certain point where it was ridiculous. What happened is I had a Jumu'ah, but Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar enjoying the good forbidding evil it was completely spontaneous so i i you know i picked that as a topic maybe once a year or something it's it's, it's an important concept in the deen of allah Azurjan. and then i had some content to cover so i said you know next week i will extend i will go a little bit into the fiqh of amr bin ma'roof now in between some brothers some musallin they come to me they say look you're not present all the time because i live far right it's not it's not my local masjid i go there just for jumu'ah and for my durus and stuff they said this is what's happening do you think this is halal because they're telling us this is okay we can do this in the masjid can you please clarify this is we during your rule. khutbah sorry this is during your khutbah no or this is a right few after. days before this is during the week so okay. i see okay. some brothers right and they're telling me what's your opinion on this can you please explain to us we don't know some people they say we can and we have in the deen of allah Zawajah, the rule is as in the authentic hadith of prophet muhammad you can't hide the truth when people they need it so then the jumu'ah right after continued my amr bin ma'roof business as usual the last segment the last 10 minutes of my khutbah i said you know some brothers they are i did not mention the name of the masjid the organization the people i said some brothers they are asking me about what's happening in many masajid this is what's happening can we do this well i explained that we should not be doing this in masajid you want to meet politicians very simple politicians they got money they can rent a hall across the you know across the road from the masjid and they can make free uh free free halal food right and invite the community we can make an announcement for them whoever wants to go visit them can go visit them because i will tell you and please tell me if you disagree with me i'm sure these politicians they must be like these muslims are weird are weird because everywhere they go there's someone who stands up 
and asks questions. Someone who stands up and disagrees. But when they come to the masjid, they have 400 people in front of them. Right? They won't even move a limb. They're like silent, like listening, like this. They are so receptive. What these politicians do not know, nobody maybe told them this, is that people, they did not come there to listen to you. And people, they cannot raise their voice. They don't want to oppose you. They don't want to have any debates with you because they respect the house of Allah Azza wa Jal. They are there for Salat and they're telling you, please say whatever you have to say. Just like, just be brief and let us do our Salat, please. You don't have to go back to work. Now, Musalin are being taken as hostages. And this is completely wrong. Then it gets to a point, and I can even send you the video if you want to share it on your channel, inshallah, in the, in the future. There's this guy, he was, he's, he's a known politician here he was running as a candidate he wanted to become the mayor of the city okay it's 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 it's, an, it's a known person here in in uh, in quebec he went to one of the biggest massages in, in in montreal here i saw the video myself and one of the brothers approached him with a cell phone and he said can you please explain to us why do you stand up with the zionists why are you against palestine do you know what the answer of this politician was to mm. this brother he he almost tell he almost told him ittaqillah he told him you know shame on you you are in a mosque this is a place of worship you should respect it you should respect it you should show respect for this place of of of, of worship and don't talk about these type of topics Priorities. and then the board people they came and they escorted the brother like please brother please please you know don't do fitna like you said before yeah, so, God forbid talk so, about the Palestinian Muslims don't God ask forbid. questions yeah. don't ask questions just submit you know sit there listen to whatever they have to tell you uh, even to a point there were once they asked me this was you know just like maybe two weeks before all of this happened the imam comes to me and he says can you make your khutbah 10 minutes shorter this time? I'm like, why? Is that because there's this lady, she's coming from this party. I'm like, I'm going to cut 10 minutes from the word of Allah and the word of Rasulullah for this lady to come. You know what? I made my khutbah longer on purpose. Allah. I added another five minutes on purpose. Now, when it gets to this point, you have to clarify. I did it with all adab, with all ethics. I didn't mention any name. I didn't say to anyone, make a revolution here, make, you know, go, I go. I just said, you know, we can't do this in the masjid. Recorded the khutbah and, you know, shared it online, everything. It was even in Arabic. This specific khutbah was not in French. It was in Arabic. Now, some brothers, they came to me right after and they said, you know what? We saw them. They were so upset. They were not happy. And one of the reasons, by the way, one of the board members, his daughter was running in the election. She was part of the election. Mm. She was a candidate. Okay. So you see the very obvious here conflict of interest. So now what happens? They don't say a word to me. They don't say a word to me. They come to me after a few days. They want to meet with me and just to tell me, you know, that uh, it's over. Three days after I get a letter from a lawyer. They hired a lawyer with the money of the Muslimin, with the sadaqat, okay, not from their pockets. They hired a lawyer to tell me that from now on, you cannot teach or volunteer in this masjid. You're not allowed. They were kind enough because, you know, they, they thought they would win my heart with that. They were kind enough to say, we appreciate so much the efforts and uh, the, the great quality of work you have offered through all these years in the letter, but you're not allowed to volunteer or to teach anything in this masjid. And then also to try to scare me, look at their scare tactics. And we can talk about this in a moment, inshallah ta'ala. It, it didn't only happen with me, it happened with, with other people. That's, that's a major thing to that people need to understand in the same letter they're threatening me that if you ever we won't tolerate you know you causing disturbance in in this center if ever you think about doing it so now it's the imam who's gonna cause disturbance right they have more like ghayra for the deen and for the masjid than than myself and also mashallah you know they think you know they own the world listen to their waqah as we call it in arabic they say also in the letter the lawyer wrote don't you dare go in on social Social media I'm talking about this because we will not tolerate this you know as if they are going to scare you uh, of course I did not really care about that I made a three hour long video two parts in which you know I explained much of the situation because it was very important I put it on YouTube a lot of brothers they watched alhamdulillah to be able to understand what truly happened and also uh, you know right after I got insider information some brother he told me watch out he told me they are planning to bring the police 
if you come next Jumu'ah. Mm. If you come next Jumu'ah, they are going to bring the police. Now, I'm not scared of the police. They can bring whoever they want. The problem is, my crowd, my Jumu'ah, there's a lot of kids, a lot of brothers, they bring their kids. Like it's it's very you're you're in a you're in a weak spot where you know you don't want our children to be exposed to this you don't want our children to see the police coming in because guess what the oldest masjid here in Montreal I don't know what the reasons were but it doesn't matter what the reasons were nothing justifies this two years ago they kicked out their imam he was an imam there for a long time very known here in the community do you know Akhi, how did they kick him out they brought the police on him the police came in the masjid to take an imam who no, was no. a community leader for almost 20 years he was the imam he's one of the most you know famous influential people here one of the witnesses that were present he told me when the police they came inside one of the cops he looked at them and he said shame on you guys you know he's doing his job legally he has to do what he has to do shame on but you guys. as a human being he's telling them shame on you guys like where did he see this before in a religious gathering that their spiritual leader quote unquote right gets ex ex like gets escorted out using the police right now as i said there are yeah, lots of other things that we can talk about but the, the, the main thing, inshallah, with which I will conclude, because, you know, as we say, as the Egyptians, they say, right? I'm not Egyptian, but I know the Egyptians, they say, just, just start from the end, just give us the conclusion, right? Without <laughs> doing the whole, just, just say that, right? The, the key question, I always ask this because, you know, Alhamdulillah, the whole community stood up with me. Alhamdulillah, you know, people, they were extremely upset. You know, they were, it was a big thing inside the masjid. But guess what? People, they were able to learn one thing, which is the answer to the question, who owns the masjid? Mm. Who owns the masjid? If you ask anyone outside, who owns the masjid in Canada, in the US, everyone will tell you, it's the community. Wrong answer. The masjid legally, all masjid are owned by organizations, yeah. non-profit organizations. And those organizations, they are, are under the full control legally of even sometimes two people. You yes. won't see them at the masjid. It's yeah. not the imam. He's not on the minbar. And guess what? At least in Canada, we have no brothers have consulted lawyers who have experience in this. And their answer was very clear. The community has no right to transparency. You can't even ask them, tell us what did you do with our money. The community doesn't even have the right to enter the masjid. One guy, the president of the organization that owns the masjid, legally, I'm not saying he's going to do it easily, but legally he can pick up the phone and say, police, please come. I want these 500 people now to be removed from this building. And I'm, I want this guy also on the minbar. I want him banned from entering this building after today. And the only question the police will ask is, who are you, sir? And he will say, I'm the president legally. They can check the papers and say, yes, he is the registered president. They have no legal obligation to make mashura, to implement what we call democracy and elections, right? They bring us uh, politicians inside the masjid, but then I tell them, how come you people, it's been almost 20 years, it's the same people on the board, like there are no other men, no other people in this community, why is it that you don't organize elections? Now, once you ask them those type of questions, they feel very, very threatened, right? They try to escape it, they see you as a threat, as a problem, because people are asking the same thing. Uh, we, we're talking about, yes, it's good to have good people, maybe who don't know how to do their things, but in my masjid, for example, the Muslim community that was coming to Jumu'ah, they are overqualified, like too much. We have too much PhDs and master degrees and businessmen and doctors, and even in the deen, a lot of Hufad of the Quran, mashallah. Now, who's running the masjid? Who's in that board? Can you believe, brothers? None of them went to university. None of them memorizes even one juz of Quran. You ask them what are the arcan of salat, they will not be able to answer you. With which logic is it that we are giving these people money when they already own a building, they have almost $3 million in their account on top of the building, yet every year they come on the night of 27th, please brothers, because here legally, that's, you know, that's, that's the trick. That's what we have to find a legal, basically, solution to this through brothers who are going to take, inshallah ta'ala, initiatives maybe with highly qualified lawyers. We have to prove this in courts. We have to explain it. 
uh, when a Muslim, and I will conclude with this point, inshallah ta'ala, when a Muslim usually, why do you donate when you go to the masjid? You don't donate to an organization. You don't donate because you know the people. You don't donate because you read their mission and you're like, yeah, I like their achievements. You donate because there's somebody in front of you telling you, قَالَ رَسُولُ الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مَنْ بَنَى لِلَّهِ مَسْجِدًا Whoever builds a masjid for Allah قَالَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فِي بُيُوتٍ أَذِنَ اللَّهُ أَنْ تُرْفَعَ وَيُذْكَرَ فِيهَا اسْمُهُ الآية. So these people, they are using religious quotes. They're not hear the law assumes that a non-profit organization when people they donate to it it's because they know its mission they know who's running it and they trust it so once you give that dollar thousand dollars once it goes inside the box you have no say anymore you can't say oh you know what i changed my mind give me back my money legally they say well you should have done your research before hmm. Whew, that's a dilemma what do you have to say I'm pretty sure you, mashallah, love this brother's uh, ideals and his approach very much so. Well, so <laughs> there's, there's a lot. There's a lot to unpack with that, though, yeah. mashallah. Um, but I think uh, if we can come back to Sheikh Abdullah for one second, because I, I know the legal. There's a lot of legal issues too, even here in the states, as far as mosques and masjids are concerned. I don't know to what degree how similar it is to Canada. Um, and one of the before we get to Sheikh Abdullah again, I just wanted to mention one thing is that after um, many years of working with Islamic and Muslim organizations, um, there's a few questions, and we don't have to answer them right now. But I think that many brothers should ask themselves uh, before getting involved, you know. And some of those are legal in matter, right? I know many of us, we may have attorneys look at our contracts before we sign them with Muslim organizations. And, you know, I think that's a very good practice, especially an upright, good Muslim attorney, right? Should look at these things because he understands the culture better. But um, what is it that we're expecting? Because I asked myself this question, what is it that I should have been accept expecting or what should I expect when uh, I studied to the best of my ability, whatever I could from the dean? And is the position of an imam or an executive director of a masjid or a youth director or a resident scholar, is this all that I have available for me based on what I understand from the masjids or the organizations of the masjid? But the reason why that's very difficult when you're younger is because you actually don't know what the masjids are like. You actually have this huge, and you guys probably know this too, you probably felt this, you're really innocent, you're naive, you're like, man, I gotta change the world through this masjid, I gotta implement everything I can, I'm, I'm afraid I'm gonna forget whatever I learned. There's all these different ideas that come to your mind, right? So uh, you do the best of your ability, and the closest thing to home, which is a masjid you're raised at, that's the one that you wanna be a part of, right? Because that's what you know. That's how you were raised, right? And I think the questions that brothers really, really have to ask themselves, and even sisters, if they're you know responsible for sisters, durus, and halakat, is that, um, number one, do I want to get paid by this organization, right? And that opens up a huge wealth of issues and dilemmas, right? And I'm just saying this for somebody who's probably gone through this, you guys have gone through this, for somebody younger who's contemplating working for a masjid or a Muslim organization, is number one, do you want to make that your primary source of income? I was just going to get to that. Right? Yeah. That... And this, um, we're going to relate this back to what your brother is saying. I'm not changing the subject. But I just want you guys to think and see if I'm thinking correctly also, right? Number one is, do you want to make this your primary source of income? That's one issue on a, on a worldly level, on a dunyawi level. The second is that, is this something that's just expected in the line of Islamic work? Is this inevitable and it's always going to happen? And you just have to do your best for, you know, Amr al-Ma'roof and al munkar speak the truth when you have to, not sugarcoat, especially when other people's lives are at stake on an Islamic level, especially. Um, or is this just the way it's always going to be, right? If you look at history and if you look at now, you know, the, hadith, the extended hadith of Rasulullah is, you know, um, I'm, I'm forgetting the beginning of the hadith, but the, um, the, the yes, the ulama are the warathat al-anbiya, right? And um, whoever seeks a path, you know, for knowledge, um, everything in this world does do offer it, even the fish in the sea, 
right? And uh, since they're the inheritors, I'm paraphrasing, of the Anbiya, the Anbiya left without not a, not even a dinar or a dirham. They left this world without a single currency of wealth, right? Not a dinar, not a dirham. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Shiuch, but uh, the ending of the Hadith is that they had a very, very difficult life. And, you know, so one side of me tells me that um, if you're going to get involved in this work, it's good to be optimistic, but realize that this work entitles you to be to have hell on earth, right? So you have two sides. You have a side where you have to make money and you think, hey, why not just make money and maybe I can get barakah to the Islamic organization. I can knock out two birds with one stone. I get my deen and I get my dunya. But when you start realizing that you're working with many Muslim institutions or, or masjids, like Sheikh Lutfi said, it's actually an organization, a nonprofit organization, which is owned by a few people, not the community. And the interest that you have for the community, they're not going to have. They're not boots on the ground. They're not expected to. They think of themselves as running a business, a legitimate religious business, right? So you have this very capitalistic mindset that's trying to make religious policies. But someone that they bring in that's supposed to make religious policies, they're not jiving with them. They don't like the way that they're thinking. So the roots of itself is are corrupted, which... It's going to be very, very difficult. Like, how often have you actually seen an imam that works for a masjid that says, man, I love this job, and it's everything that I want it to be? Except for the few masjids where I know a brother that he formed his own masjid. He's a sheikh. He's, uh, there's a few people. There's one in California, a brother that I know. He doesn't really have a board. He has a group of close friends of his who are his advisors. He owns a masjid. It's under his name, right? And... He basically does all the durus, and whoever wants to be imam, he lets them be imam. Like he has a whole setup, but he didn't register it as uh, uh, like a business, right? He registered it as like his home, and it's like a community center type thing. But he's just going to be the person who's uh, responsible for the content that comes in, right? But there's no board, there's you know no donations, or that. Mashallah, brother's well off. He doesn't ask for donations. He has a business that supports the masjid, so he never asks for donations. Really, really cool setup, right? So those are the places that yes, his brother he does whatever he wants. He teaches whatever he wants. They're the exceptions. They're the exceptions. Yeah. That's. 0.000001% of the messages that are out there in the West, right? But other than that, you've never seen a brother that says that, yes, I love this masjid, and they listen to everything that I have to say, and they gave me the reins of whatever I say goes as policy. And it's never going to happen because they're businesses, and they're considered businesses. And when a businessman doesn't like, or he's not pulling in money, or there's an individual, a bad apple, that's going to mess his investment up, he's got to get rid of him, right? So... All, from everything what I've said, but bring it back to more on a uh, on a spiritual level, if you want to call it, more of an Islamic level, is that you have to understand what you're getting yourself into. And this is not a means, at least when I'm talking on the part of the podcast, and not to dishearten youth from coming to the masjid. That's not what it is at all. Because at the end, it's Allah that has to be worshipped. No, anything can happen to the masjids. It doesn't matter. If all the masjids get destroyed, it doesn't matter. The earth is a masjid. Right? It doesn't matter. You can pray wherever you want. And people are eventually going to band together and pray in Jama'ah. So the masjids, in the, you know, based on the unity of the Muslims, are actually insignificant. Right? Imagine Rasulullah standing in front of the Kaaba and saying that one drop of Muslim blood is more valuable than you and its surroundings. Right? That's the Kaaba, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that it's a very, very difficult path to be a part of. And my personal opinion is that if you're a, a part of a path which is picking dawah, it's there's, there's, it's actually problematic if it's a very easy path, right? Um, but it's very rewarding if you're able to do it on the way you want to do it. The dilemma with messages and organizations are, is that they've entrusted you to do it and told you that they want you to run it the way you want to run it. And, but if it's something they disagree with, they end up ostracizing you, right? So that that's basically um my two cents on that you know so are, are you brothers uh considering going the private route are you thinking that this is might not be uh what it's cut out to be i know my impression is Sheikh lutfi actually does this is a part-time thing right yeah Sheikh lutfi you're, you're muted again you're muted, you're muted yes sorry just to, just to expand on what the sheikh amir was saying 
Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. You know, in, in my case, as I said, you know, I work with different masajid and obvious, and, and to be very honest, I don't know about the US and Toronto and everything. Here, what they give you or what they are willing to give you is peanuts. They don't give you anything. So it, like the option of, you know, the only option they give, which I don't do as a principle, and by the way, they don't like you if you don't do that, is fundraisings. If you do fundraisings, uh, you can take shares, you can take oh, yeah. a percentage for that. There's money to be done. They're looking, just like you said, for business partners. If you can stand up there and, you know, beg people to give more money. If you bring in, in money, you're a good investment. They are willing to give you a lot of money. But just to give you money, just to do dawa, so that you are teaching people Islam and everything, here, at least in our case, you know, they only give you peanuts. So I was never really relying on them. And alhamdulillah, oh, yeah. you know, I have learned very early on to be very independent. Alhamdulillah, bifallah, azza wa jal. However, the, the, sa the same problem remains. I'll, I'll give you a story very briefly in one minute, okay? I know one brother who's a da'ya here. He's a good student of knowledge, mashallah. And, you know, he was, this happened just a few months ago. And he started giving durus and, you know, becoming part-time imam at one, at one masjid. And then he was telling me, they're good brothers. I'm like, I don't agree with you because, you know, I know some of the details and stuff like that. And then just barely a few weeks after, he said, they came to me. They interrupted me on Saturday night. I just sat down to start my halaqa in front of everybody, my Saturday dars. They said, stand up, come with us to the office. They wanted to talk to him. And they wanted him to take a salary of $600 a month. He said, no, I don't want $600. Just don't give me anything. It's okay. I'll work, you know, for free for the sake of Allah. They fired him because of that. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not taking a salary also, they can't control you. Yeah. Right? So that's also for them. It's not a good thing. You have they your don't own mind. Like that. Yeah. So, you know what Sheikh was mentioning, Sheikh Amir, if we take that only purely from a imam's point of view, yes, you know, we can say to the imam, be independent or just be patient, whatever you are facing. However, the question remains, these people, they are in control yes. of our major masajid. They control the narrative. They control what can be said on the minbar, what cannot be said. One of the du'at I was talking to, very famous person, I'm not going to say his name, and he came here and he was shocked. He told me, you know, they called me at this place to give because he's very famous and he's known and stuff like that. He said, but then they told me, we have some, don't talk about feminism. Don't talk about <laughs> subhanallah. Like they're, they're putting restrictions on you. Now, the question is whether we like it or not for the layman, for the normal masses, right? They have no idea. They think deen equals the masjid. What the masjid is telling me to do, that's the deen. So I can, I, subhanAllah, I have experienced it myself, you know, myself inside the masjid and outside the masjid, inside the masjid with the same crowd. There's a lot of things where I'm much more credible to them uh, compared to what I do outside the masjid. You know, outside the masjid still, you're doing activities, but inside the masjid, oh, it's like you're, you're imam, you know, you're, you're the sheikh. You, you said it, so you must be right. So... I think that's, you know, that's one thing that we really have to uh, put more research on, more thoughts on, because our zakat money is going there. Our sadaqat, mm. zakat al-fitr. At that masjid, zakat al-fitr. They misuse zakat al-fitr. They don't know what to do with zakat al-fitr. The Eid is over, it's passed. Two days after, the brothers were telling me the, 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 the money was still inside the office. Mm -hmm. Zakat al-fitr. Our sha'air depend on those people. Even, you know, if myself and Sheikh Abdullah and everything become very wealthy, we have our own businesses outside and we are so strong and independent. But it doesn't change the fact that these people, they are even to the eyes of the society, to the eyes of the media, of the government, they represent Islam. They, they say we are the mosque, not, not the other people. Yeah. So Sheikh Abdullah, where are you standing now? What's happening What's happening in, in your case, if you don't mind? You don't have to get too detailed, but, you know... Sure. So what are the know, after effects basically of all this? So, you know, from the get go, I remember our teachers, they would tell us that, look, you have to find another way of, of earning your livelihood. And um, of course, you know, like as far as permissibility goes, yeah, it is permissible for a person to take, you know, uh, the money from the masjid because he's giving his time and all that. But you will never find a scholar who will advise you to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And I, and of course, you know, it, maybe in Muslim countries it happens more often. But, you know, with our teachers and the ulama over here, they will tell you that so long as you are uh, taking a paycheck from the management, you won't be able to serve the deen properly. You mm -hmm. won't be able to do it because 
they i mean they they don't if they they're giving you money they will talk to you different and if you have a and if you are taking money right but you have some type of degree or you have some other means of earning or you have some, another you know secular education they will talk to you differently and treat you differently uh, so mashallah there are imams who i know as well who um you know they they started their own masajid and their own you know masallas and things like that and and, and you know it's it's tough it's not easy you know, like like you're saying that uh, that hadith al ulama waratul lambia, right? That the ulama they're the heirs of this of the uh, of the scholars, and there's another hadith as well that that the al ambia ashadun nasi balaan fal amthal fal amthal that that the ambia they they get the hardest test in the world. So as a scholar, you know, as being an alim, you have to be ready that look, you know what I I'm taking this path of of giving dawah and teaching people the deen. I have to be ready to face the difficulties as well, right? But that doesn't mean that you compromise when mm. it comes to teaching the deen. Like Sheikh Latif mentioned the hadith that that to conceal knowledge when you have it, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will make you wear the 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 reins of fire, you know, on, on the day of judgment. It's considered a major sin. And so for sure, I mean at this uh, right now, um I'm I, I made intention that that's not gonna happen again. Like I'm not gonna be taking a paycheck, at least from from layman, if I'm working under other ulama, sure, right? And inshallah, that that is what I'm what I'm doing right now. I'll be traveling soon, but then after that. But you know, this uh, the the one, another thing that I want to say is that you guys were talking about <laughs> some type of imam union, right, or ulama union. That's something, unfortunately, that I don't see happening, right? Why? Because we ourselves, the ulama, mila, mila, forgive me, I'm not speaking on ta- you know on behalf of anybody. I'm speaking on, on behalf of myself. But what I see is that a lot of us are being you know content with you know what the masjid is doing and as long as i'm getting my paycheck hmm. and i'm able to take care of my family you know why should i risk my employment why should i risk my job by joining a union that i know my management is not going to like the management are, are not going to like this this imam's union you know so i i know my you know a lot of we have a lot of scholars here in the gta and they've been talking about it I'm sure well over a decade, they've been talking about it for years and years. Let's start a union. Let's start a union. It's not that hard, but it's not going to happen because, you know, like, I, like if I, it's unfortunate, but you know, some of these masajid, they will treat the imams and ulama so badly and disgrace them so badly. Mm. And then right after that, you know, Mella, forgive us. You'll get somebody, you know, also a sheikh, he'll come and he'll come and take his place. Like, come on, man. Like, you know, and you know, I, it's like you, you've seen how they, you know, you should you should be standing up for him. The ulama should work together and stand up for him. But I guess you know this is that time where the Prophet Sallallahu said that there will be one in your heart, right? This is like so we're so weak, you know, we we don't have the courage to do it. You know that 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 our relationship with Allah is so bad that we, you know, we don't have enough courage to stand up against these people, and we're just letting it happen, you know. And um, so it's very unfortunate but i would i mean and anybody who i see studying now any, any you know youngsters who are studying the knowledge of deen i told them it's very good this is the best thing you can be doing but don't think for a second that you're going to earn a penny from this because if you you know well, once you take that route like you're asking for trouble just be independent make sure you study something else as well make sure you have another means of livelihood because um, you know that's, that's that's the mistake i made and i'm and not you know my teachers they they did explain this to us and they would tell us this as well that if you really want to serve the deen you have to be independent. You cannot trust on these masjid management people. And um, they said it, but this is something that I will emphasize, you know, even more now to anybody who, or any of my students or anybody who I know is studying that, look, just that money or, or you know, as a job aspect, of looking at this as a career, being an imam is the best thing you can do. Yeah. You know, the, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu was an imam. The imam. Being an imam is the best thing you can do, right? As a, as a, you know, uh, as a lifestyle, right? But as a career, it's probably the worst. Yeah. Well, a lot of our listeners really need to understand that throughout the Muslim world, that imams and, and the scholarly the scholarly class are muzzled. They can't speak freely. And most or many Muslims from the Muslim world, they look to the West. They look to the imams in, in the UK, Canada, and America for because we're free speech, we we have the ability to speak on anything in whatever way we want. But when we have our own institutions, our own Muslim institutions who are independent and have the ability to uh, grant us that free access to speech, 
they they're muzzling us from talking about important topics that are affecting our society our just the world in general whether it's the, the tyrants that are ruling the muslim world to uh the various uh, uh social issues that are plaguing muslim families not being know? able to talk about feminism okay. yeah like, <laughs> it's a no, shock I, know a guy, I know a guy who was uh he didn't even he wasn't even on the member he was teaching quran and you know you have these high school kids so he's he's telling one kid about uh about you know this whole um homosexual lgbtq issue and kid ended up talking to about his parents nothing wrong with it the Muslim management found out and they and they kicked him out for that they're like they're like you don't why are you talking about this this is not your job you just teach quran okay mm -hmm. i i know i know one other imam he's a he's a relative of mine before he went to um say, you know um sign the agreement and sign the papers for being an imam they had their written that you will only talk about what we tell you to talk about you cannot speak on your own like you know if, we will choose i know an imam who's been serving for for so many years maybe like 20 years uh one one time there was a management that they they told him that you have to send us the Juma khutbah before you right and these are laymen okay if you're answering to other scholars or things like that that makes sense but these are people who haven't studied the knowledge of deen you know and they're telling you that Look, there's that hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam too, right? That it, there's a community that, that I, I can't remember how the hadith goes, you know, but exactly. But this is a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, you know, um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, um, is speaking negatively about a person who um, is, you know, he insists on being the imam and the community is not happy, right? The, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaks negatively about a person who's insisting on being an imam and the community is not happy. You know, if the imam... If the community, you know, we have Muslims who are smart, they're educated, right? In this part of the world, if the imam is saying things which don't make sense or the community doesn't like it, the community will stand up and they'll speak against him, right? The community should be able to do that. That's fine. But not these management people, right? Not these people who, who have their own goals and their own agendas in mind, right? They, because mashallah, when the community does speak on issues like feminism or, or LGBTQ or any of this type of stuff, and, you know, mashallah, we... We as Muslims, we pride ourselves in the fact that the, Jew, the Jewish community gave up. They gave in to the, to the LGBT community. The Christians, they gave in long time ago. Every other religion has. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this, this beautiful deen that we are the, the source of light, you know, in this time of darkness, that we're standing strong with our beliefs. And now you have these masajid coming in and telling you that, no, you need to compromise. Like, you know, yeah. so where's the guidance going to come from, you know? SubhanAllah. Well, uh, Sheikh Lofty, you had said that there was some bombshell at the yeah, end of it. Yeah. You, can you tell us what that was? Let her rip. Sorry, that there was what? Sorry? You, said, some, you uh, said there was something you want to say for the end. That you... Well, that, no, that was that was the point that I wanted to... Oh, the police? The whole question about who, who owns the masjid. Who okay. Who owns the masjid? Gotcha. Yeah. It's, about the, it's about the governance. You know, the least we, we need to do right now at this at this moment of time is to spread awareness is for our Muslims to understand that when they enter the masjid, if you're going for Salat al-Jumu'ah, you're going for a regular Salat, first thing you need to understand, it's not the Imam on the minbar who's the boss in that place. It's not the volunteers and the employees, you know, welcoming you at the door or the one working at the office. Most of the time, it's people that you barely see. You have, I, when I used to be Imam at that place, I used to do investigation to know who's on the shura this year. Sometimes two, three months after they tell you, no, that guy is not the president anymore. Once they told me, oh, we brought you a new president. Basically, we brought the community. We brought you guys in you, president. Okay, so it's like we are in the Arab countries. So you, you you're living in Canada, but you know inside that place, there's there's the other system. So just like I said before, you know, yes, we can find solutions. Very easy to find solutions for the imams to be financially independent and so on and so forth. But that will not change the fact that as an imam, if you go on the minbar. And the microphone is broken. These people do not want to invest on a proper microphone. They, they, they are so cheap and stingy that they just want to invest on buildings, things that they can show off with, money that goes sometimes to their pockets. And I'm not making any generalization here. There are great brothers who are in charge of Masajid, and I still work with a lot of them until today. 
as I said, some of them, they're friends of mine, right? They're unprofessional. They don't do the best things. We go, we take coffee together, and I try to, rem- to, 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 to explain to them, you know, what is the reality of the youth, of our women. They're not doing anything for our women. Like here, for example, in the city where, where I live, even when they talk about the youth, they mean the boys. They forget the girls, right? They forget the, <laughs> our, our daughters. We have our massage. They have to be there for our daughters as well. But there's not much you can do if you don't have a budget. You know, even if you're a wealthy person, you cannot put all of your money at the service of the community. It has to be the sadaqat. It has to be our shared resources. It doesn't make sense for us that we get to a level. Can you believe that? You know, sometimes, sometimes we were forced. We were forced to pay masajid. I did it personally to pay a masjid. Pay them to rent a room to teach Islam. Can you believe this? Oh. I'm paying a masjid. A place that is, you know, taking donations from the Muslim to serve yep. Islam. You're paying them so that you can have a space where you can teach Islam. Masajid, just one last example, inshallah. Masajid here, they are closing, you know, they are closing. Many masajid you go, it's closed. You want to make salat, it's locked. They put a lock on it. It started with after the Quebec incident, as you, you remember, there was, you know, a, a, a killing in Quebec City where six of our brothers, ta'ala, they were killed by an enemy of Islam. So they said, you know, we need to take security measures. What are the security measures? Lock the doors. And then it became worse with COVID. So now we bought masajid, we bought buildings. Canada, Montreal, Sheikh Abdullah is in Toronto. Here it's a little bit worse than you guys. Montreal is extremely cold in the winter time. You have nowhere to do your salat. And the salawat, you know, Dohar and Asr and, and, and Maghrib, they come like one after the other, right? It's like one hour and a half, two hours is like the next one. And you have nowhere to do your salat outside. You can't go to a park. It's minus 30 degrees. Some brothers, they work on the road. Some people are students. They need to go to the masjid to pray. Many masajid, if you don't show up for the iqama, they finish the iqama. In some places, ha- happened to me personally. Salamu alaikum, salamu alaikum. You're doing your dhikr. Brother, please, you need to leave. We need to close the masjid. Why? For security reasons. Why security reasons? Because there's no money. There's no donation coming in. Jumu'ah is, right, it's a, it's a winning business, so they need to keep it running. <laughs> but the rest of the time, let's close the masjid. Uh, well, um, we have a... a... First, uh, I, I want to thank a brother Basil who had set up this uh, interview with uh, with you guys, and uh, I had asked him if he could jump on and ask some of his own questions. So he's actually part of this uh, meeting. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, invite him on. Do these brothers know Basil too? Yeah, of course. Okay. He's the one who arranged everything. Okay, okay, got it like that. Sure. No, I tell you, Actually, I have some guests over, so I'm just going to make a quick comment slash question um, before I go. Uh, but I just wanted to say, may Allah bless the Mad Mamluks brothers. May Allah bless mm-hmm. our Mashiach here. Um, for those listening, I just want to say that uh, you might be listening to this. I'm not sure how it's being interpreted, but as Sheikh Lutfi and Sheikh Abdullah both said, we love our masajid. In fact, th- there's many, many masajids who are not being commended. They're doing a fantastic job. We're not here to obviously bash anyone, but obviously what we're, what we're talking about today is that there's room for improvement with some masajid. So if, if anybody wants to uh, share this podcast with their local masjid, uh, you know, do it, I'd say, in a very professional manner because, you know, like I said, the worst case scenario would be we stop supporting our masajid. We stop getting involved in masajid, and that's not the effect that we want to have. So if you want to share this with somebody, uh, please put a caveat there or, or, or side note saying that there are many massages. We're just talking about how to improve some massages. Number two, I think it's really important as an outcome, you know, what can we think about is that um, I think what would be great, inshallah, ta'ala, again, I'm coming as a lay person here, uh, but our dear Mashayikh kind of already hinted at this, that we need some kind of guidelines. Right now in the U.S., if I'm not mistaken, a lot of massages are regulated by the IRS. Here in Canada, it's the Canadian Revenue Agency. In the UK, it's the Charity Commission. Are the, is this sufficient regulation for our masajid, or do we need to come up with some Islamic guidelines that are informed by fiqh, the Quran, the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? You know, um, there's so many things. Uh, you know, again, this is another another huge topic, of course. But I, I, I'd say I think I think when we uh, Sheikh Lutfi and Sheikh Abdullah, when, when we spoke internally uh, prior to this, we had mentioned three things, which is we'd love to see 
tools like a shura board or just masajid doing shura, uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the Quran, the, the mashah here can, can talk about it much better than I can. This is such an important uh, tool it's that is often overlooked in our community, doing but, shura. Basil, uh, it's number uh, one, man, having an emir, many of these right? are, having an emir, Basil, doing shura. Uh, and number two, having activities, uh, educating the community. That's really important. As Sheikh Lutfi said, both the sisters and the brothers. And then finally, increase transparency and accountability. I don't think the IRS, CRA, or, or Charity Commission is enough transparency. We need some kind of Islamic guidelines, and that's, that's only my com- my only comment. Barakallahu fikum mukhani. Jazakallah khair. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi One quick point about the shura. Many of these organizations think that their board is a shura. That that in itself serves as a shura. What, what do you what do you guys think about that? And, and the other comments that the Basil said. I mean, they should have. They should, I mean, if they have a shura of of people, you know, who are knowledgeable, who've been serving the Muslim community, or they've been involved in dawah, or they've, or they should have ulama in there for sure, right? We, yeah, we don't. As far as you know, I we know in our cities, you know, in in, in Montreal and Toronto and Chicago as well, mashallah, there's no shortage of ulama. We have seniors, we have younger guys as well. So, you know, to really use them in our shura and for them to make mashura with them. And uh, that's, if you could do that, but no, for the, for the masjid management to think that they're the shura and they should decide everything, no, that, that's not going to work, no. And the shura doesn't work that you're going to close a closed loop of people that are going to make all the decisions <laughs> inevitably. And those are the only people you're going to consult. That's not what a shura is, right? A shura is like you said, you have to have the people who are ahl dhikr the people who are uh, specific, like the scholars. Like one setup that I saw that was a really cool model was one of the boards. They were attempting to build a masjid and they were all ulama of the deen. One of them was an attorney, an ulama of the deen. One of them was an entrepreneur, an alim of the deen. One of them was like, uh, used to be a judge in the Muslim world. One of them was a very well vetted 30 year imam. And not only that, before they decided they would get community members and tell them, hey, this is what we're discussing, right? Can you guys give us some of your input and have one night a month of all of the issues, internal issues that they would definitely need help as far as, uh, because they, they, we take in messages, we have volunteers who are from the community and we work these volunteers so hard, but they have no idea to just follow orders, right? There's no like humanity and letting them know like, hey, like the way Rasulullah used to treat the Sahaba, right? Like Rasulullah didn't have to consult them, but he did, right? And I was just talking about the, just the Battle of Badr, right? To to, to at, the, uh, at one of the masjids and uh, imagine Rasulullah when they go out after the raid of the caravan right and they don't find the caravan of Abu Sufyan right because we have to understand Muslims were in a state of war when they migrated to uh, Medina two years after their migration Abu Sufyan is taking his caravan of goods which belong to the Muslims uh, Muhammad gets news that Abu Sufyan's caravan is coming and they go to raid the caravan, right? And I'm speeding this up. Abu Sufyan finds out about this, turns the caravan back around, or changes the route. And um, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam consults the Sahaba. He says, what do you think we should do? Uh, we came here to get the caravan, but the Mushrikeen in Mecca now are told that Muslims are coming out for war. They don't have any weapons. They have, I think, two horses. They have nothing. They just came out to raid a caravan to get their goods back. Right? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam literally asking. Miqdad, he stands up, he says something, he says, and then he has Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, right? Now, he didn't have to do any of that. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could have decided, and that's it. And it's so dire, this situation, that even during the dua of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Battle of Badr, he's making dua to Allah, he's pleading to Allah, Ya Allah, uh, please make us successful because this if this army dies, there will be no more of your deen, right? So imagine that Rasulullah is asking uh, not just a, a small group of the Sahaba, he's asking who's there, and he didn't have to, right? One beautiful, and the last thing I'll mention about this, just for Shura, so we understand, like, where we understand the magnanimity of it, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have to inform the angels of anything, right? Yeah. It's Allah. In Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَعْضَ بِاللَّهِ وَرِشْتَهُ وَرَشِيمُ وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً Right? When Allah mentions to the gathering of the angels, 
I am creating a representative, a vicegerent of mine on this earth, right? And Allah didn't have to actually even inform them. He could have just created Adam alayhi salam and that's it, right? So uh, Muhammad Ali al-Sabuni, he says something really beautiful, who's a, a mufassir, I think. Uh, yeah, he's, he still is alive. Syrian or origin, lives in Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, he mentions that one of the things that we extrapolate from this is Allah is teaching the ummah from the creation of human, the original creation of a human being, that Allah is actually teaching the angels and extension us of what the most successful factor in this being is going to be, and that's going to be shura, by Allah informing the angels. And he even gives the angels an opportunity to re respond, right? Yeah. Right? The angels actually said, Oh Allah, are you going to create a being that's going to create mischievousness and, and spill blood on this earth? Right? Yeah. And Allah said to them, I know what you don't know. Right? But look at that. And to say exchange because what happens with us human beings is obviously a much different exchange. It's above the seven heavens, right? But imagine how merciful Allah is that he allows us to have a glimpse of between him and the angels of the creation of this human being and there's almost like this shura that's being displayed right at the creation of the human being and that's not coincidental right so many of the scholars of the past of Fasirun, they said that the reason why allah in the creation of the human being the first creation of this human on earth is going to be by way of a outwardly ashura because this is the ex like Rasulullah sent him he said what there's no success in anybody if there's no shura right yeah. there's no there's going to be no success right so i think that this thing of the, the concept of shura is a very very islamic concept it's not something that some people said oh Umar just like i heard somebody say this before oh you know Umar the uh, one developed the calendar yeah the shura council is <laughs> it's something very similar and in my mind, I was thinking, you're an idiot. <laughs> but I didn't say that, obviously. You know? So I think uh, the Shura Council thing is a great idea. It's a great, great idea. And it can't be limited uh, only to the board members because that's just this little echo chamber that's just... Like the brother, told, the, uh, Abdullah, I think it was the one who said, I can't remember who said it, the, the board member whose sister was running for office. Yeah. Th that's such a conflict of interest. Far please. Far please, yeah. Wow. No, uh, and if, if go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry, if I can add something about the shura, uh, just like first of all, inshallah, if you could just make dua for Sheikh Ali Sabun, you mentioned him, yes. because he passed away last year. Was, Did like, he pass away last year? year? Yeah, he passed Inna away. Last year. I didn't know that. Inna yeah, Inna it was, uh, you know, with all the news happening nowadays, subhanAllah, we even forget who's still alive. I had no idea he passed, he passed away. It's crazy, subhanAllah. Sallallahu Allah ta'ala and yarhamma, inshallah. You know, yeah. Shura, Shura, just like you mentioned, it's it's more than a council. It's it's a value in our deen. We have a, a, a surah that has the name of Shura. And that name is because of one ayah. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةِ وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ Shura is mentioned between Salat and spending fi sabirillah. But now in the masjid, we have salat, and then right away they, speak, they skip it, they go to spend fi sabirillah, right? Spend fi wow. sabirillah. But where's the shura? Great Just like you said, you can yeah. have a shura member that consists of people who are uh, more qualified, people who are wise, who have experience. There should be some rotation in that also because you want people also to be available. You want to different generations to be represented as well. I'm not saying, you know, everything should be discussed with just like any, uh, any random person. However, at the same time, just like you brought, very interesting, the story of uh, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Ma'arakat Badr when he con consulted the Sahaba, right? The story of Abu Sufyan. Because Allah Azza wa is telling Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Even Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's been requested to consult his companions because there are matters where it's not related to the deen. It's related to people's responsibility. Yes. Now, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi like they said in Fiqh Sirah, the ulama and everything, because the Sahaba, especially the Sahaba, the Ansar of al Medina, when they made bay'ah to him, the Aqaba, when he came to Mecca, their, uh, you know, basically their contract was not to go out and make conflict with him outside of, of, of al Medina. Hmm. They had no obligation at that point to do that. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he knew that, you know, he had to leave it uh, up to them. 
they, they were free to go back to Medina if they wanted to, if they didn't want to face Abu Sufyan. Now, in our masajid, there are situations where, yes, you can make shura with all the musalli, with the full salat of Jumu'ah, because it's nothing related to the deen. It's related to people's money, right? You want to make renovations of the washroom. Well, before you take the decision to invest $20,000 to break a washroom that's working, working perfectly fine, but you just want, you know, like the sensors in the water fountain and so on and so forth, something fancy, you can stand up after Jumu'ah or on the night of 27th or something like this, make a vote and see if people want a new washroom or not a new washroom. You don't need to be a alim to be able to answer that question question it's people's money right like they say no uh, no taxation without re re representation if you're not being represented why should i give you my money mm -hmm. and just one last example about shura that you know again illustrates how a lot of these masajid again not everyone how they are being run like i said you know here it was extremely restrictive in the times of covid it was like insane there was a point where they just declared curfew the government imposed the curfew right before ramadan started they mm. kind of did it on purpose okay oh, but that's 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 a different story so it's a curfew okay now at that masjid where i was talking about right just like two days before ramadan starts they said we are closing the masjid for salatul maghrib people they were shocked it's ramadan we want to do our salatul maghrib at the masjid so i went and i spoke to one of the people at the you know on the board i said salatul maghrib is at 7 40 p.m the curfew starts at 8 p.m right we people a lot of brothers they live right across the masjid they can come and then do your salat and run to your house he said no i said why he said because you know what some people maybe it's gonna take them some time to come back home and it will be past 8 p.m i said well as long as they are outside of the masjid it's not your responsibility he's like no it's my responsibility i said these people they're adults i said at least what you can do just go and consult them because there are other communities like the Yahud here for for example they were challenging all of these regulations they didn't care about the curfews right they were going and they were making their prayers openly right I'm not saying we should do the same thing necessarily however you consult the community what do you want to do in such situations because guess what even if the police comes nobody's going to jail it's not a crime it's a regulation related to uh curfew covid maybe you will get you know uh you will get a ticket as as we call it you will have to pay a fine basically who's gonna pay the fine the muslimin maybe the yeah, community thinks that you know it's worth it to get a fine and and to be able to make salatul maghrib in jama'a you know in in the month of ramadan why not some brothers will tell you i will, I will pay for it if we have a fine but there's no consultation no shura it's a one-man show you know uh these are we hope and pray inshallah that you know people who are listening they spread the word they spread these ideas about shura and other ways to improve their local mosque but the the reality is that the majority of mosques will expand on their power and their influence over imams. They're going. They're going to continue to uh, hire more docile, easily handled imams that won't, you know, that won't question them. That will uh, serve to further their hold on the the community. So, um, it is for that reason I encourage. Uh, as many brothers such as yourselves or as anyone else because i i know these people in the way they they work they operate because they're, they're they work they operate like a corporation and when we see these similarities because they're a corporation part, without hr yeah so, yeah. so <laughs> there's no human resources exactly so there's no lr there's no labor there's no you can't submit a ticket to none of that so yeah I mean, we, we don't know every single person's <laughs> intention That's a good we don't know every single person's intention who volunteers as you know masjid president or, or or serves on the board but many of them we can say many of them they do it for influence and, and power and they have no intention of uh or it, it's uh serving islam is, is much lower on their priority than uh their than fulfilling their own um, self-interest and stuff mm. so i encourage brothers to uh form uh get jobs or careers in other industries where you don't have to be working for uh, a mosque or a Islamic organization and your income and your livelihood is tied to it, to that because many brothers won't be able to walk away from what you brothers did you know mm. they'll 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 their livelihood is tied to that yeah 
So it's it's important that you, you utilize your vehicles like YouTube and, and podcasts and other ways where you can spread your knowledge and, and dawah to the to the Western world because this is the last line of defense. Otherwise, the Muslim world's already been muzzled. There's hardly any free speech over there. We have that responsibility. We as a, as a podcast, we don't uh, we, we hate to even ask our uh, sponsors for support and stuff, even though we have in the past. But it's something that's the last resort when we have to upgrade equipment and things. Mm. But many of what much of what you see over here is from our own resources or it's from our patreon uh helpers and people who have supported us through uh to set up whatever all the lighting and equipment and the mm. televisions here uh tens of thousands of dollars of, of of money that has gone into this has been the support of uh individuals who are working they have regular careers they're not they're not tied to other Islamic organizations, and uh, it's important that we we set up our own Ooh. efforts. It's it's just there's no way we can. Uh, I'm not saying going to say no way, but there it's very unlikely many imams are going to be fortunate enough to um, have a masjid or any an Islamic organization that will, won't stop them from speaking what what they want to say. But yeah. Um, Thank you, brothers, uh, Sheikh uh, Abu Abdullah and Abdullah, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Abu Tamim. <laughs> Abu, Sheikh, Abu, Sheikh, Sheikh Abu Abdullah, Abdullah <laughs> Ibn <laughs> Hamid Ali. <laughs> triple A's, there, there's three A's. There. He needs to throw the Abu in Sheikh there. Abdullah <laughs> and Sheikh Lahti. Uh, Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Um, listeners, please help us out. Patreon.com backslash the Mad Mamluks. Every one of you guys are responsible for the content that comes on this thing you you share in the reward or any khair that comes from this effort we we thank you for uh, all your support um if you guys have any questions or comments make sure you uh message us at uh, info at the and otherwise uh Sheikh, if you have do any these brothers want to be contacted is there because usually when we have guests we say yeah. if you want to reach these brothers do you guys want to be contacted about anything or you guys just just here for raising awareness like that's one thing i was unsure of because i don't want to put you guys in a weird position keep your emails out and you guys start getting barraged by emails or anything mm -hmm. so uh yeah you guys can just for have my, the finishing word i guess yeah, for my for myself uh they, they can go on facebook instagram TikTok. i don't advise it but i still have a TikTok account <laughs> it's uh one qibla so it's o-n-e qibla q-i-b-l-a or directly one qibla.com actually uh the only home page right now is just like um uh, contact and basically links to all the social media and, and Abdullah? no i don't want to be contacted <laughs> <laughs> smart man smart man mashallah shit. all right brother so thank you so much for having us it was right. honestly no it was yeah. refreshing man it was great man. our platform is your platform so if you have any other subjects you want to talk yeah. about feel free to reach yeah. out to us and we'll make sure that happens yeah whenever you want to do the full expose and throw them completely under the bus hit us up <laughs> yeah we're here That's for it he's excited about <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it's really hot in the studio. Right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, brothers. We'll talk to you later. Thank you again. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum.